Southampton, the tide of history. Southampton's unique double tide effect has attracted seaborne settlements for 2,000 years. Many great journeys have started at Southampton, and journeymen from other lands have arrived here and changed the shape of our country. Roman invasion. The Romans built Clausentum at the southern tip of the river Itchen, where Bitten stands today. It flourished as a trading port till the Saxons drove the Romans out. The Saxon settlements of Hamwick and Hampton flourished till 1000 AD. And then the Vikings came and settled at Olaston, today's Wolston. In 1014, the Viking King Canute may have been crowned King of Sewell Hampton, but he never reigned over its tides. He got his feet wet. In 1066, the Norman Conquest. So now we've got a French king, William the Conqueror. We'll trade with France. Trade what? Our wool for their wine. The king built Southampton Castle to store his wine and precious goods. Merchants we'll be. And want for nothing. So Southampton men and women built walls round their city. Walls that lasted for hundreds of years. Bargate, Eastgate, Arundel Tower. Burgesses ruled the town. Merchants all with their fine houses and wine cellars and well-fed wives. But there were no walls between the big houses and the sea, so that porters could unload ships straight into carts for the merchants' houses. I unloaded a ship from the Mediterranean today. What was on it? More wine for his cellar, silk for her. My cart was groaning. Oh, I'd love a silk dress. Straight from the ship to his door. To wear to St Michael's Church on Sunday. Fruit, oil, oh. glass. Porter's wives don't wear silk. You will. One day all the women in Southampton will wear silk. On Sunday, 4th October, 1338, they regretted not building those walls against the sea. We thank God for the prosperity of Southampton. We are among the richest merchants in the land, but we must remain humble in God's sight. French pirates! French pirates! Fifty French and Genoese galleys came to Southampton and their occupants attacked our women and carried off all the goods in the town. The Burgesses fled before them. The town was at their mercy. They plundered and burnt at leisure, hanging some of the townsfolk in their own homes and clubbing others on the streets. At least we're still alive. One cock and pot! They burnt Southampton to the ground, and it took a hundred years to rebuild all those homes and shops and livelihoods, and for the town to recover from this great destruction. Even the king's wine at the castle was looted. King Edward was furious. Build walls, close the town. The merchants' houses will be turned into a, a solid wall against the sea. Gates and gaps between the houses were walled up. Doors and windows were blocked, and gun ports for cannons set into the blocked doorways. Finally, the wall was strengthened by adding the arcaded front, the arcades. John Fortin's house at 58 French Street, although badly damaged, survived the French raid of 1338 and was eventually repaired. The saddest year in Southampton's history. 1415, Henry V and his army leave Southampton through the West Gate to fight the French at the Battle of Agincourt. Once more, unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty, and his brave fleet with silken streamers the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies. And in them behold, upon the hempen tackle, ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle, which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the threatened sails, born with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottom through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, 
cry, God for Harry, England and St George. Southampton expanded its trade with other countries after the French raid, and by the 15th century, the wool trade was dominated by the Italians. Italian merchants moved to Southampton, and the galley crews, often from North Africa, were the first black people to come to town. Southampton even had an Italian mayor, Christophe Abruggio. In 1500, one of the city's finest houses was built, Tudor House. Huguenot refugees escaping from religious persecution followed in the 16th century and settled in Southampton. Among them were artisans who made serge cloth, which became a major industry at the time. Arrivals and departures on those famous tides were forming the history of Southampton and its people. In July 1620, the Mayflower, a square-rigged sailing ship weighing about 180 tonnes and measuring 90 feet long, arrived at Southampton together with her sister ship, the Speedwell, for the Pilgrim Fathers to prepare for their long journey across the Atlantic. Only 41 of the 104 passengers were pilgrims seeking new religious and political freedom. The rest were merchants and adventurers seeking new opportunities, servants, hired hands and crew. A young Southampton cooper, John Aden, was hired to look after the water, beer and other stores. There is a great decline in the fortunes of Southampton. There seems nothing but wars and plague, with this town seeing the comings and goings of both. The Mayflower is sailing to a land of new opportunities, so with my tools and my hope, I join the company. August 15th, 1620. The Mayflower leaves Southampton for one of the most famous sea journeys ever made, its epic voyage to the New World. But the Speedwell's seams opened and leaks sprung and the ships had to put into Plymouth, where the Speedwell was eventually abandoned. If it wasn't for the Speedwell, Plymouth would never have seen the Mayflower. We were 63 days on the waves and there was much sickness and hunger, but only one death. The medieval merchant's house at 58 French Street changed its use as Southampton's status as a major port dwindled in the 17th century through war and disease. It was divided into three tenements, then converted back into a single building with a dubious honour of becoming a Mrs. Collins lodging house for theatricals. It is a very fine boarding house indeed. The theatrical artist is to be highly regarded for the theatre is our great entertainment in days of trial. Daniel Defoe visited Southampton in 1740 and wrote, Southampton is a truly ancient town for it is in manner dying with age. The decay of the trade is the real decay of the town. Once again, it was water that was central to the town's resurgence in the 18th century, but not this time through ships and trade. Southampton became an unlikely venue for the fashionable who came to enjoy the spa waters and indulge in medicinal sea bathing. Jane Austen rented a house in the town, going to dances at the Dolphin Hotel, and royal patronage stimulated the town's development. However, it was the introduction of steam navigation that was to be the key to Southampton's growth. A railway link was completed to London in 1840, and two years later, the Southampton Dock Company opened its first dock, today's Ocean Village. As the 19th century progressed, the demand for ships and for men and women to crew them increased. Southampton and its people responded to the challenge and entered some of the most turbulent times of its long history. Men left from Southampton to fight the Boer War, and not long after, hundreds of thousands of young men left to fight the Great War. It was so sad, because we used to watch the ships sailing out in the morning, crammed with soldiers, and then watch them coming back in the evening as hospital ships, full of wounded men. 
Southampton, gateway to the world. Mauritania. Franconia and Caronia. The Olympic. The tragic Titanic. 550 sons and daughters of the city perished when she sank in April 1912. The Britannic. Aquitania. Berengaria. Scythia. The Queen Elizabeth. Southampton. Home port of the most famous of them all, the Queen Mary, the greatest ship ever built. 80,773 tons and 1,018 feet long, a little different from the valiant little Mayflower. The boat train pulls into its special platform alongside Ocean Dock and offloads its excited passengers. I can't wait for my first glimpse of the Queen Mary. I say! It's taller than Nelson's Column and longer than Trafalgar Square. Stewards dressed in their new Queen Mary uniforms trundle large trolleys loaded with piles of expensive luggage towards the ship, each suitcase and trunk proudly displaying special Queen Mary labels, bearing a picture of the ship and giving information as to the cabin number, deck and class. Step into a world of luxury. A new world of friendly service in which for the next four and a half days your only thought will be to enjoy yourself. Your immediate surroundings are panelled in fine woods, close carpeted and brilliantly lit, a foyer of which any luxury hotel would be proud. Every cabin is different, each one designed by an artist in interior decoration, each one having its own character. All ashore, going ashore! How wonderful, how exciting! The voyage is about to begin! The passenger list on the Queen Mary's maiden voyage read like so many pages of who's who. But it wasn't the captain at the bridge or the famous boast that you could order any food that you could dream of that made the Queen Mary what it was. It was the crew. The remarkable personal service provided by the stewards and stewardesses, the bellboys, the bedroom stewards, the waiters, the nursery nurses, Southampton men, women and boys who earned their living on that great ship. I got two pound a month as a bellboy, working 17 hours a day. Delivering messages, all sorts. And the better you were, the smarter you were, the more tips you got. When we got to New York, the noise that greeted us was incredible. Perhaps some of those Americans were Southampton people, descended from those who sailed on the Mayflower. We bought roller skates with our tips and skated round the decks on the voyage home. I crashed into the head waiter and was put off limits for the rest of the journey. If there was a film star on board, Greta Garbo or Douglas Fairbanks, and the New York Daily News wanted a photograph, I would have to go and get them to come up on deck. Big tips for that. I've never been a saint since I fell into the arms of Kirk Douglas one day when the ship was rolling. In March 1940, the Queen Mary was requisitioned for wartime service, and in June 1940, Southampton suffered its first air raid of the war. The raids gradually increased. Southampton is known as the city of the Spitfire. Designed by R.J. Mitchell and test flown from Eastley Airport, the Spitfire was to win for us the Battle of Britain. But the bombing continued and the nights of 30th November and 1st December 1940 were the worst in living memory. 600 years after the French raid of 1338, Southampton was destroyed once again this time by Hitler's Luftwaffe. Fires burned even worse than before, and people were killed in their dozens. The German bomber flattened most of French Street, and number 58 was severely damaged, but remained standing. The high street from the bar gate downwards was full of flames. There was no water and no fire service. They were stretched to the limit. Opposite the Dolphin was the Queen's Hotel, and shop by shop the fire spread till it engulfed the hotel. If the building had fallen out, the Dolphin would have had it. 
luckily it fell in. Holyrood Church was in flames. The heat made the bells move and they were ringing all by themselves as the church burned. I was at the Regal Cinema in the High Street on the first Saturday night of the Blitz, selling ice creams. The bombs dropped and people went mad trying to get out. We had to stay there and that was when they got the top half of the town. I don't think a lot of people today could go through that. I got to the top of Chalk Hill and it had started. The bombs had come in and they put a green square of flares around Southampton and they were just coming and tipping the mad living to the square. Where they went, they were interested. They blew hell out of Southampton. London Road was 18 inches deep in mud and fire hoses when it was hit and afterwards it looked just like a macaroni pudding. By the end of 1941, the United States of America had joined the war and were sending aid in the form of leased land cargoes to Southampton. The build-up to the invasion of Northern Europe had begun. When the Yanks themselves arrived at Southampton Docks, the locals knew the port would be involved in D-Day. Certainly round here, near to the main Winchester Road, you saw all the troops being moved to the docks. Thousands of them. Dad was a great rose grower, and we had over a hundred in the garden. They were just coming out, some in bud and some in full bloom. So Dad stripped the garden and gave them to the soldiers. They put them on their tanks and on their hats. It was mentioned in the newsreel about the Red Rose of England going back to France. On Monday, 5th of June, 1944, the fleet left Southampton. Two-thirds of the entire British assault force passed through Southampton. After the war, the town could slowly rebuild and the liners could sail again. Aircraft began to take away the passenger ship's trade and the port became more reliant again on its goods trade. In the 1950s, the already cosmopolitan international port welcomed immigrants from the Indian subcontinent, the West Indies, the Far East. In 1964, Her Majesty the Queen granted Southampton its rightful city status. In 1967, Suttonians waved an emotional goodbye to the grandest lady of the seas, the Queen Mary, on her final voyage to her Californian resting place. But her departure was made less painful when her stylish successor, QE2, became the city's flagship. In 1976, tens of thousands travelled to Wembley for the FA Cup final to see the Saints defy the odds and beat Man United 1-0! In the 1980s, Southampton embarked upon a period of redevelopment which saw the city emerge as one of Europe's busiest ports and the region's capital for business, education, the arts, shopping and, of course, sport. Today, Southampton is booming. West Quay is attracting a million visitors a month. Important yacht races start and finish at the waterfront. A new stadium opens for the Saints next year. And Craig David and Artful Dodger are in the charts. What would the figures from Southampton's rich history make of today's modern, dynamic and forward-looking city? A city where great journeys still begin and end. The gateway to the world.